say you are what you eat, so I don't eat chicken feet. But I love me some of Grandma's pickled beets. Well, cut it up, put it in the pan, throw it over your shoulder and see where it lands right here in the farmer's kitchen. Baiters, taters, beans and corn, the cows in the barn and the sheep's been shorn, kids in the barnyard chasing Grandpa's chicken. chicken, chicken. Spices, slices, cuts and dices, gonna slash your grocery prices right here in the farmer's kitchen. Help you grow your garden good with recipes to suit your mood. Try some grub you've never tried before. Smash it with a wooden mallet, gonna educate your palate. Right here in Farmer's Kitchen, in town Farmer's Country Kitchen. We're gonna cook something good now. Hello and welcome to the Farmer's Kitchen. We're the farmers and this is our kitchen. And as you can see, we've got all kinds of brightly colored vegetables and fruit mm -hmm. and all sorts of things because it's that time of the year. Yes, it is. The other day, I started a food journey and I couldn't get away from it. Mm -hmm. Here's what started it. Corn relish. Thought about Papa Harlan and I thought about the relishes that he had on the table as a kid. So you think about the relish that we have. We have the green tomato relish. We have pickle relish, chow chow. So many things that come from this line of relishes. So tonight, this can be a bit of a history lesson. We're going to go back one generation, two generations, then several hundred years ago to see where this came from. So Papa Harlan, now Aunt Teresa got these pictures together for me, and I thank her for that. Papa Harlan, when we went to his house, we would always smell relish. And I would see him put his relish in with his meat. Mm -hmm. If he had, say, some roast beef or whatever, he always put some relish on that. When you think about relish, you think about all the things that we have right now. The garden is full, the trees are full. What happens when you have all that bounty and it's going to spoil? What would you do? I think I'd try to can it all. Exactly. Canning began as a necessity. You think about folks right around the Depression who had very little. Any little bit of vegetables, any little bit of corn, carrots, whatever they had right before it would spoil, they would a lot of times take that and put it in a vinegar, sugar, and salt solution. So when people don't waste food, we're spoiled nowadays. Right. We have all the food we need just by driving to the store. But back then, if they had anything left over, a lot of times they would cut that up and make a relish out of it. If you go back, the root word is a French word, R-E-L-E-S, which meant leftover or remainder. This is a little different show because we're talking about a lot of history. So I got really curious as to how canning came about. So Napoleon Bonaparte decided he was gonna take over the world. But his troops, when they're out and about, what if they entered a town and uh, the natives had no food for them to steal? So he issued a challenge. It's worth 12,000 francs, which wow. today is about $250,000. If someone can come up with a solution where we can carry food that is safe to eat. Hmm. That's he, interesting. He issued that challenge. <laughs> a fellow by the name of Nicholas Appert, A-P-P-E-R-T, I'm trying to pronounce it like a, like my buddy wow. Raul would, yeah. Appert. Oh, wow. He said, okay, hey, I'm up for this. And he had already been kind of digging around. This was way before pasteurization and all that sort of thing. Some villagers around France were reportedly taking some jars, some thick glass jars, heating them up and sealing them. And they found that that would keep that meat, vegetables, or fruit fresh. Wow, interesting. Later, they determined that if they put the vinegar and the salt and the sugar, which gives it a nice taste oh, of boot, yeah. that really gives it a shelf life. So this Nicholas Appel would take these jars, these thick jars, and he would take a vise and put the cork in the top as tight as he could, he would bring them up to boiling, and he was kind of guessing on the time of how long he would have to cook each one. Everything has its own, meat's a lot longer right. than vegetables. Would seal them further with wax, or he would even take a wire mesh and put over the top of it to keep it sealed. So he's the king of canning. He's the king of canning. Wow. Now, way back when, even things that you would find that had been canned were called appetized. Okay, really? After yeah. him? Way back when. I found this so fascinating that all these things we take for granted that wasn't that long ago. You're talking right. 1800s. Yeah. 
people learned that they could store food. That later came over here and we talk about our grandparents. What we're gonna do now is take some of our corn that we've cut off and make this pickled corn, which is delicious. It is. Now, if you've never had pickled corn, think sweet pickles kind of solution with the turmeric and the celery seed and the vinegar and the red peppers. You get a wonderful taste. And sweet corn in it. And sweet yes. corn, obviously. All right, so we'll do this together. I'll Twelve try that to corn. Yeah. And this is some fresh, wonderful sweet corn. And we boiled this, blanched it, kind of chilled it, and I cut this off the cobs. Mm -mm -mm. It's hard not to eat it right there. I ate a lot of it already. I know you did. I watched it. I know. I can't help it. I can't resist it. I'm going to use my chopper because it makes everything easier. You know what? I really like a red pepper in these, a sweet red pepper. I think it really lends itself well it's to really the recipe and the end product. I mean, look at that. It just looks pretty. The celery in there gives just a little bit of crunch. Well, we need about a cup of pepper, so let's see if we can get a, a cup of this. So we're almost a cup, so we'll put a little bit of this yellow in there. Now, did you know that red, green, and yellow peppers are the same pepper at various stages of their life? So they all taste the same? When you pull them off the vine. They're just pretty. They're beautiful. And that is the beautiful bell pepper. All right, there's our pepper. Now, if you want to give me some onion, we want about a half a cup of this. Half a cup of onion. Celery, some people put cabbage, but yeah. we like celery. You know, I think about cabbage more as a, a, a green relish type thing. Yeah. And it's gonna have a little bit of green in it, but those, that celery kind of blanches out. You don't see a whole lot of green in there. Just gives it a nice crunch. And a nice taste. Celery really works well with that. You know, this is kind of like your mom's chow chow. You can use whatever combo you want. Mm -hmm. She's always said that. Put in what you like. As long as it gets up to about two cups. And there we got two cups. Now look at that. Pretty it colors. already smells delicious. You ready for some? Yes, yeah, so now you have your two cups of vinegar and half a cup of water in there. Vinegar. Yeah. There's actually a cup of sugar right there for you, too. Cup of sugar? One cup of sugar. That's a lot of sugar, but that makes it good. It's a preservative. That's right. So we need a half a tablespoon of salt. We're going to go a half a tablespoon of turmeric. Heart healthy turmeric. Yeah. And what an interesting, wonderful taste that brings. And here's some celery seed. Half a tablespoon of celery seed. One tablespoon of dried mustard. Once we get this up to a little boil, mm -hmm. we go. Let's go 20 minutes. 20 minutes. So food to the table. I talked to Dad on the phone, trying to get some information about Papa Harlan and his relishes, right. and he let me know something I never knew about him. So let's go visit with Dad and see how him and his dad brought food to the table of folks in Louisville in the 40s. Wow. Today's whole show started with a jar of relish. Do you know how sometimes when you see something or you smell something or you hear some music, something reminds you, I mean, really dramatically of uh, an event oh, sometime, yeah. someplace? Yeah. Back in the day, you and my grandfather, how would you bring food to people's tables? Where did it start? Where would Papa? get the food and where would he take it and how would he get it there? A lot of people had moved from the farm to the city. Some people had small gardens, but uh, and a lot of people didn't have cars. A lot of the food, uh, you'd either have to walk to the market, uh, and they did have supermarkets, A and P and different ones. A lot of times it was quite a walk just to get to the store. My father saw, I think, an opportunity and so he was uh, self-employed, had a little pickup truck, and he had it fixed so that uh, he could go to the farmer's market early in the morning be before daylight. Farmers would come in from the countryside, all kinds of vegetables there. He would buy up a truckload of everything, corn, beans, tomatoes, squash, and load his truck up with bushels of fresh produce from the country. 
and he would come get us kids and he would put the major things in racks alongside the truck. Tomatoes in one basket, corn, beans, squash, cucumbers, whatever. And we kids had big baskets, two, two baskets. And he would fill our baskets with those things, you know. And he had a certain price for everything set. And uh, he would set us out on a street corner and we would go down door to door, one side of the street, ring the doorbell or knock on the door. People come out and a lot of people, they didn't want to walk to the grocery, so they would buy food from him, from us. And while, while we were working, he would go to regular customers. And he would take the vegetables to the old people that couldn't get out, that uh, really, it, it was a help to them. He did that and we did our thing and he paid us. And uh, I think I noticed on something I had written up, 10%. If we would sell $30 worth of goods in a day, we'd get $3. Which was good of, pocket money. A lot of money right for there. us, for kids. And we had our own little garden. Where we lived was a very narrow lot, maybe 30 feet wide, maybe, I don't know, 100 feet or more long. We had a little garden, we had grapevine, we had a big apricot tree. And in our garden, we had things like tomatoes and beans. You know, so here you are in a situation where you would think, you know, a displaced family came out of the country into the city. Your food came to your table via, you know, you'd have some gardening that you did yourself. Um, you had people like Papaw bringing in produce and you had a horse and wagon called the Donaldson Man, right? Yeah, uh, the bakery goods <clears throat> were brought fresh to the individual homes. We call it the Donaldson Man. It was a, a big, enclosed, fancy wagon of some kind. And it was horse drawn, great big horse. So he would park his horse and wagon under a tree Kids would come out, the horse was real friendly. We'd pet the horse and talk to the horse. And that was always a treat when he came. And then we had the ice man. A lot of people didn't have refrigerators. We did, we had an old time refrigerator, but our next door neighbors and different ones, they just had ice boxes. He would come, I guess once a week, however often. And he had huge, big blocks of ice and he'd take an ice pick and he would cut out just the right size block for this one and just the right size block for that one. When the ice man came and make all those chips, he would let us get those chips. And we could, we could see him coming, you know, and we'd run and get a salt shaker and we'd put salt on our ice and eat the ice with it. And that was a treat. On, that was a treat, yeah. And in season, they had strawberries and you'd hear the, the man coming, a, a block or two off, strawberries, strawberries. And he had a big crate of strawberries that he carried and people would run out to him to buy their strawberries, you know. And also uh, watermelon, same thing, watermelon, watermelon, and people come running to buy the watermelons. But if I remember right, they sold those off a truck and the truck kind of kept up with the man, but they were still broadcasting the watermelons for sale. And they had cantaloupes and stuff too. So you think about this, that, that wasn't that long ago. And it was just, what does it seem like 10 years ago to you? Yeah, just yesterday, you know. Just yesterday. Mm -hmm. Things change so quickly. Now that smell right there, that's what I remember. It smells good. In Papa's kitchen, mm -hmm. and Mom's kitchen, that pickled, wonderful relish. Smell. Oh yeah. Now, your beautiful, wonderful, special thing, which I really enjoyed the other day, is? It is actually a carrot cake, probably. Preserve? Um, preserve, jelly, whatever you want to call it. But it's all the stuff you love in a dessert. Mm -hmm. And I thought on a biscuit. And this one's pretty simple, too. We're going to start off with carrots, because carrot cake has carrots. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use, I don't know what I do without this little chopper. I'm going to have to use my chopper. I need a cup and a half of carrots. It's a pretty good start to anything, yes, carrots. It is. carrots. I need a cup and a half, so let's see if I got me a cup and a half here. So a cup and a half of carrots, put in the pan here. I need a cup and a half of apples. 
So I'm now, I'm gonna cut my apples and I'm gonna take the skin off of them also, get rid of the seeds. And we're gonna chop these up. And as far as apples, I, you can pretty much use whatever you want. I just pull whatever we had out of the fridge. All right, let's, we need a cup and a half of apples. Gotcha. So we have a cup and a half of apples. And this is crushed pineapple mm -hmm. that I just bought. And it's a, I measured out a cup and three quarters. And put the juice in. Now I have three tablespoons of lemon juice that I mm -hmm. squeezed. That's gonna go in there. A teaspoon of cinnamon, half a teaspoon of nutmeg. And then I have, I actually didn't have crushed cloves, so I went ahead and crushed my own. Smashed them up. Smashed them up. And I have, I need just a quarter a teaspoon of cloves, maybe a little extra, I like cloves. Now we are gonna bring this to a boil just like this. And that goes for 20 minutes too? Yes. When it boils for 20 minutes, then we're going to add a few things to it. All right. Now, as we visited with Dad earlier, I want to talk to Mom about her growing up in the country with her grandmother. So let's talk to Mom about her memories of growing up in the country and what they canned and put in the root cellar. So I've got my mom right here. I just talked to my dad. Do you know him? Did yeah, we? real well. He's a pretty cool dude, isn't he? He is. You know what, Mom, we look back. I'm fascinated by the past. I'm fascinated by your stories, by his stories. You just wrote a book about your life. I thought I knew everything about you and Daddy, and these details just keep coming out, and I find them fascinating. So, you know, a lot of that book talked about when you started growing up in the country with your granny, and you mentioned Chow Chow. Now, you made Chow Chow on the show, you liked her chow chow, but not so much her pickles. No, I did not like her pickles. They were even an unusual color. They were kind of a blue color. And I remember the first time I ever tasted it, I thought, this can't be a pickle, but it sure, it sure is bad. Whatever it is, it's you really bad. You probably had those old lime pickles. That's probably what, what they were. They were terrible. And you know, that's an old timey thing. I bet she had developed a taste for that when she was younger. Probably so, because she and Peppa ate them. I didn't know. Well, let's talk about canned goods and what, what you all grew out in the country and what, what do you remember her canning besides Chow Chow? Oh, she canned everything. Of course, corn and uh, green beans. She even canned peas and uh, that was a nuisance. Fooling with peas, oh, you know, yeah. I thought, there's gotta be a better way to do this, you know. We'd sit there and I would help. I'm glad now that I did, because I think it pleased her. You know, you had kind of a, um, a different experience, you know, I guess the kindest way you could say you got, in, got shuffled around a little bit. So you would go to Granny's and you would have some pretty rudimentary meals, which I'm sure, and, and some wild game as well. Mm -hmm. Then you would go to Moy's and Poise, and, and what, what was the difference in the situation? What, what would you look that forward to? That was city, that was the city. City food, eaten in a, a city setting. The dishes all matched and were really nice. I appreciated that. My grandmother had, she had plates, different, different colors, different styles and all that. And I never could understand why she didn't find a set that matched. <laughs> They were both great cooks, my grandmother and my grandfather. He could cook as well as she did. And they would fix pork chops, and they knew I liked mashed potatoes and gravy. And there was always uh, vegetables, any kind of vegetables that were uh, that, that time of the year, they would fix that. So you have a different memory, but of the same company. When we talked about the Donaldson man, you remember one too, but what was different about that? Well, he wasn't in a, a wagon. He was in a truck. And it was a green truck and had like gold lettering on it. And uh, whenever we knew he was there, he was usually come at certain times. And Mother and I would go down and she would let me pick out this one type of pastry that I really did like. And she would pick out something that she liked. And uh, also we got a coloring book too. So did Granny have a root cellar? Uh, she had a cellar. It was really odd. It was a really odd situation. There was a smokehouse behind the regular house, but to the right of the smokehouse, Papaw had like a tool shed. But if you went into the tool shed to the back corner, you could lift up a door and fasten it and go down the steps into her cellar. Hmm. And she had shelves on all three sides. 
and I can remember the colors, the beautiful colors that were there. She had places where you could put pumpkins or apples or pears. Potatoes. Yeah, potatoes, yeah. And, uh, but it was not easy to get into it. So a lot of times she sent me. I loved to do it. I thought it was an adventure. Well, I tell you what, I constantly think back and uh, I remember things at a very young age, but some of those memories are just absolutely wonderful. And I'm sure you feel the same way. I think it was good for me because in the, in the city, I, I was a spoiled little kid. I really was. But when we moved to the country, Grady straightened, straightened me out real mm -hmm. quick. Yeah, it didn't take her long either. So if, if you look just two or three generations back, everybody's, everybody's out in the country farming. The war, depression brings people into the city and then you made that conscious decision again to take me back to the country and that's the only way I know how to live. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And the wonderful memories. So we have completed our boil. We take a little funnel. We're gonna fill our jars up. Yummy. And you know, you're gonna leave a little head space there. Just a little bit. I wish you could smell this kitchen. I absolutely love pickled things. I love preserves. This has gone 20 minutes. I'm gonna add a whole container of pectin to this. Very nice. I'm gonna put that in and we're gonna let that simmer. I'm gonna turn it up a little for about a minute. Now I know this seems like a lot of sugar. Six and a half cups. Six and a half cups of sugar. Now remember this. We gotta stir. This is something that we eat in the spoonful, not in the jar full. And again, sugar is a legitimate preserver. Oh, look at that thicken up. Mm -hmm. and I'm yeah. gonna put this on simmer for a little bit. There's the rest of it. All right, now, anytime that you make preserves or jelly or jam, you know that there's a lot of sugar that goes into that. Now, once this is all melted in, we're gonna give it a minute on simmer. All right. I have two more things to add. This is what makes it carrot cake. Uh -huh. I got a little over half a cup of coconut. I mean, you just keep on putting good stuff in there. And pecans. Okay. I'm going to put in, and, I, and when I've made it before, too, I've just used mixed nuts that I crushed up. But let's do the pecans today. Beautiful. All right. You could eat that like soup. I think this is ready for the jar of soup. Now, I'm going to put the tops on these. We have cleaned the tops off to make sure that there's no blockage at all. And I'm going ahead and filling my jars up. I'm going to get those on there fairly tight. Now, when you talk about the old ways, of canning. A lot of people remember paraffin was used. You remember paraffin wax mm -hmm. was used to seal jars? All right, so we're going to set these in here. And you got five and I got three. Put the water over the top. That's going to go for 15, 20 minutes. That's right. And we're going to have some good stuff. Now these are about 18 minutes. So we're splitting the middle. But one thing that is important that happened, people say you can't make biscuits. Oh yeah. Three ingredients. Look at that. It's beautiful. Perfect. You hear people all the time say, I can't make biscuits. Check out our three ingredient biscuit recipe. All right, so let's take the magic out. Yum. Yummy. Look at that. Beautiful. Now here's a little secret. When you put your water in, put a couple tablespoons of vinegar in. It'll help keep the tops clean. Sometimes I get a little white pasty stuff on the top. This will help with that. Yummy stuff. Look at that. Yummy. So how about we take one of these monster beautiful biscuits, split it directly in half. Beautiful. And put you some. Do you want butter first? Yeah, go ahead and put some butter on there. That's good. That's split it. This is like dessert. Okay, so we need to get one. So here is our one tablespoon we're limited to. <laughs> of pure delish. Pure deliciousness. Now while our butter is still melting, make sure this is to your liking. Corn relish. Mm. Isn't that good? Mm -hmm. It just reminds me of Papa Harlan's table. He always had some sort of relish. My grandfather did too. Always had relish. That was the thing you did. That, I could just sit and eat that. Mm. Delicious. The moment we've all been waiting for. So dessert before dinner? Okay. Mm. Isn't that something? Wow. It tastes like a carrot cake, doesn't it? <laughs> You're going to mm. eat that whole jar, mm. aren't you? Mm. Yummy. Mm. Mm. Oh, wow, that's delicious. I'm a... That's fabulous. That's wonderful. Canning is a lot of fun. you got to be careful. you got to follow the rules. 
But Mrs. Farmer, do you know what happened? What happened? Our half hour ran out. Yes, it did. So when that happens, we have to say bye to everybody. But first, if somebody wanted to find these recipes, where would they go? They can go to timfarmerscountrykitchen.com. And if you want to be our Facebook friend, which we do want you there, it's a long, lengthy process. What do you have to do? You hit like. That's it? That's it. It's easy. You know what? Thank you for hanging out with us. I've got all this mess to clean up now. It's going to take me hours. Yes, it will. And I'm going to go sit down and relax while you're Okay, you sit down and relax while I clean. Okay, thank you. Meanwhile, it's all about... Good times. Good friends. And really good eats. See you next week on a brand new Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. I need more of these. You do. So do I. We have been catering for a lot of years, and I wanted everything to have a specific taste. Therefore, I had to come up with my own products. Right. A dry rub, chow chow, and our barbecue sauce are something that we use in all our catering gigs. I developed this barbecue sauce that is not the th really thick, syrupy stuff that you get. This is, has more of a natural, it's got some pepper and onion flavor, and you can actually see the particulates in there. You know, a lot of people are asking what we use our dry rub on. Now, obviously, pork and chicken are two of the more common things. Also, we've been using on our corn on the cob with butter. That is I'm telling you, this stuff wonderful. with potatoes is fantastic. So 40 years in the making, Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen Dry Rub. Mm -hmm.